The goal of procedural due process is to ensure that the government follows fair procedures before it takes adverse enforcement action against a person. As with all legal rules, the most important thing is to know when to use it. Procedural due process does not control whether the government is allowed to deprive people of life, liberty, or property. That question is resolved by other doctrines. Procedural due process asks not whether the government may impose restrictions, but how it goes about enforcing those restrictions against an identified individual. Pause the video for a moment and decide which of these laws would implicate procedural due process. The correct answer is C. Laws A and B deal with the substance of the law, what conduct is forbidden and what punishments will be imposed. If there are any constitutional objections to these laws, they would involve different topics, like substantive due process, equal protection, cruel and unusual punishment, or if they were federal laws, a lack of enumerated power. By contrast, Law C is about the procedures for enforcing the ban on goldfish. And in fact, the procedures here seem quite bad. If the government wants to deprive a person of $100 as a consequence of violating a law, it must have a better procedure for determining liability than simply relying totally on an anonymous accusation. Because procedural due process can potentially be applied to any sort of governmental enforcement action, it is necessarily flexible. Depending on the situation, different procedures might be required. The next diagram helps visualize this idea. In this graph, the x-axis represents the seriousness of a deprivation. Life imprisonment without parole would be more serious than a junior high student receiving an hour of after-school detention. The y-axis represents the protectiveness of the required procedures. A full criminal trial before imprisonment has far more elaborate procedures than a junior high student's meeting with a school principal before receiving a detention. Considering the seriousness of the deprivation, we recognize that some events won't count as deprivations of liberty interests or property interests at all. In those cases, the Constitution doesn't require any particular procedures, and the procedures can be decided by the legislative or executive branches. But some events will count as deprivations of liberty or property. In this zone, the Constitution will require increasingly more protective procedures as the government attempts to impose greater deprivations on individuals. To translate these concepts into the language of the Kickstarter, let's use a simple example of a $50 ticket for leaving your car too long on a city street that is limited to one hour of parking. The procedures typically used for parking infractions are quite different from those in criminal trials, and even in most civil trials. Unlike civil trials, there's no personal service of process. Instead, the notice is a piece of paper stuck under a car windshield. And unlike a criminal trial, if the case goes to traffic court, the government will not provide a lawyer for those who can't afford one. The Kickstarter begins with some threshold questions. These determine whether the government owes the affected individual any procedures at all. The first step, deprivation, is usually not a major bone of contention. First, there's a state action requirement. The Due Process Clause only limits the ability of the government to deprive people of life, liberty, or property. Here, the parking ticket and the $50 deprivation are definitely imposed by the government. Second, the government must be taking something away from a person. If my city doesn't operate a bus system, I can't claim that I've been deprived of a right to public transportation. I never had that right to begin with. Here, however, I have the $50, and the government wants to take it away. Finally, a series of cases hold that the government's action cannot be merely negligent, and instead must be deliberate. In our example, the parking ticket was put intentionally on my car by a city employee, and the city intentionally seeks to take money from me. Now that we know the government is engaged in a deprivation, the next step is to consider what is being deprived. 
If an interest is sufficiently important to require some minimum amount of procedural protection, we call it a property interest or a liberty interest. A property interest is some sort of entitlement created by substantive law. This includes the things we ordinarily think of as property, like real estate, money, or chattels. It also includes other benefits that the substantive law declares that people are entitled to. Prominent examples include financial entitlements, like welfare benefits or food stamps. For those, people are entitled to receive them upon showing that their incomes are low. Or a driver's license. In most states, the substantive law says people are entitled to a driver's license if they're the right age and they pass the necessary exams. Liberty interests are rights protected by the U.S. Constitution, even if there is no specific substantive law entitling people to them. Now, this is not a precisely defined category, but at a minimum, it includes enumerated constitutional rights and any unenumerated rights that are considered fundamental. In our parking ticket example, there's unquestionably a property interest. There's $50. You might be wondering if the city is depriving me of something more than just the $50. They're depriving me of the right to park on this particular street for more than an hour. Now, this kind of argument is really a challenge to the substance of the one-hour parking limit. It's not a challenge to the procedures for enforcing the one-hour limit. So procedural due process is the wrong lens for the problem. But just for kicks, we could ask whether the right to park in this location for more than an hour is protected by due process, and the answer would be no. First, substantive law doesn't give me an entitlement to park in this location for more than an hour. In fact, substantive law does the opposite. So there's no property interest. And there's nothing in the Constitution that would protect my right to long-term parking, so there's no liberty interest either. If there's deprivation of a liberty interest or property interest, our final step is to decide which procedures the Constitution requires. In our parking ticket example, the driver argues that there should be personal service and a right to court-appointed counsel. When deciding whether these are processes that the government owes to the person, Many court opinions would look at the problem holistically. They would use whatever methods of reasoning seem to best fit the facts. So on the request for court-appointed counsel, a court might think about the text. The Sixth Amendment gives a right to counsel in criminal cases, but there's no mention of right to counsel elsewhere. A court might then look for precedents that are on point, or if they're not directly on point, at least in the neighborhood. A court might think about structural considerations, like separation of powers or federalism. Those questions might arise because a federal court could be telling a local executive branch how to behave. A court might consider the history of past American practices, and whether traffic courts have traditionally appointed counsel, and so on, thinking about consequences of this decision and the values that it reflects. In addition to these familiar kinds of legal arguments, Procedural due process opinions often consider three factors that are described in Matthews v. Eldridge. These factors are not any sort of bright line test, but they help point judges toward relevant questions. The Matthews v. Eldridge factors are often referred to as a type of balancing test. On one side of the scale is the interest of the individual. The more serious the deprivation this individual is facing, the more weight that this factor deserves. In our parking example, the private interest is $50. So this is a constitutionally protected property interest. But compared to things like loss of your driver's license, eviction from your home, or a criminal conviction, it is pretty small. Next, we consider whether the procedures the individual wants would be valuable as ways to prevent wrongful deprivations of this property. The more likely it becomes that the procedure would help avoid a wrong decision, the more weight goes on this side of the balance. So how much more accurate would the traffic court decision be if, instead of putting tickets under windshields, there was personal service of process? Probably not much. The vast majority of parking tickets don't blow away in the wind, and most drivers do receive notice of the parking problem through this method. 
As for counsel, the traffic court hearing will not be legally complex. It's just a matter of proving whether the car was parked there too long or not. This is something most litigants can and do handle on their own without counsel. Weighed against these interests are the costs to the government. Now, these costs might include both out-of-pocket expenditures of money, but also impacts on the efficiency and the effectiveness of government operations. In our parking example, the procedures that the driver seeks are not likely to make the city less effective at enforcing its parking laws. But there's a really big financial cost because process servers, and especially lawyers, are expensive and labor-intensive. So overall, we don't have very powerful interests on the individual side, and we have a potentially bigger cost with regard to the government. So when we couple these factors with precedent, history, and any other relevant concerns, we can see why the prevailing traffic court methods in the U.S. do not violate procedural due process.